Hey everybody, welcome to this week's edition of Me Weekly, this time for January 22nd, 2021. I'm Hero TJ, coming at you from Taipei, Taiwan. Let's jump right into it. Now, we all know that this year Nintendo is celebrating a very special anniversary. Legend of Zelda turns 35. And we're hoping that we get to see some pretty cool Legend of Zelda related stuff in the form of maybe some HD remakes coming to the Switch, some other type of port, maybe a brand new Zelda game, hopefully some cool merchandise. Is it too much to hope for some amiibo? But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. There's another very special anniversary happening this week that will probably go largely unremarked as it's not one of those nice round numbers like zero or five. I'm talking about Super Smash Brothers for the Nintendo 64. It was originally released on January 21st, 1999 in Japan, which means that it turned 22 this week. My home country of America wouldn't receive the game until April 26th, 1999, a little bit later that same year. Game series director Mr. Masahiro Sakurai did commemorate the anniversary with a charming little tweet with an image of Mario, Samus, Yoshi, Pikachu, and Link utilizing the in-game models for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate to recreate the opening sequence from Smash 64. For a longtime fan like me, this is a cute and clever little homage to the game that started it all. As it was a pretty light week as far as Nintendo news is concerned, I thought that this would be a fun opportunity to just take a little bit of time to talk about Smash 64, my experience with it, and what it means to me. As I said, it first came stateside on April 26th, and I was a day one adopter of this game. I'm not exactly sure how it got on my radar. Everyone who was around at that time remembers the commercial where all the characters were dressed up as mascots, beating each other up. It was set to the tune, So Happy Together, and then all of a sudden they just started fighting in this epic costumed melee. I think I actually owned and played the game before I ever even saw that commercial. There was surprisingly little fanfare when the game first released. Now a Smash title is an event. There's like a year-long buildup. Each new character announcement is a momentous occasion, but back then it was just kind of quietly dropped onto the shelf. The promotional artwork was really subdued. You had these cute little comic-y cartoon renders. Of course, we all know the series would go on to be a juggernaut for Nintendo, but at the time, I feel like Nintendo was really timid about promoting it. Maybe that's just my perception, but at least amongst my group of friends, I was the only one who bought it. Heck, I was the only one who even knew about it, and I made it my personal mission to shout the good news from the top of every mountain. I was in high school at the time, and I lugged my 64 around to every friend's house I could, and we had these epic four-person parties just picking our favorite Nintendo mascot and beating the daylights out of each other. It was an absolute blast, and I have some really fond memories of the game, but I think what really made it so meaningful for me personally is that I already had a deep connection to almost all of these characters. I was familiar with all of them. I knew every one of their games. I owned most of their games. I've been involved in martial arts for pretty much my entire life. As an adult, I moved to California and became a professional sword fighter and stuntman. I love fighting. I mean, I love it. And I was that kid who would walk around all the time obnoxiously pestering people with the question, who would win in a fight? And many times these questions would feature characters like Mario and Link, two of my favorite childhood heroes. If Mario and Link threw down, who would win? So for me, Smash 64 was not just a cool game where I got to play as cool characters who could beat each other up. It was the fulfillment of a lifelong dream to be able to pick my favorite Nintendo characters and beat the stuffing out of each other. <laughs> and in that 22 years, not much has changed. I mean, think about it, not much has really changed. The Smash series has, of course, expanded in a lot of ways. I think most notably the roster has expanded to unbelievable proportions. But what fundamentally made this game fun and attractive at the time of its initial release I think is pretty much the exact same reasons why we keep going back to it today, making it one of Nintendo's best-selling franchises of all time. The original Super Smash Bros. was a pretty successful game for the Nintendo 64, selling something like 5 million copies, which according to the SSB Wiki makes it the fifth best-selling Nintendo 64 game of all time. Last I checked, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is the third best-selling title on the Nintendo Switch, selling something like 21 million units, behind only Mario Kart Deluxe and Animal Crossing. I'm glad the 64 title did eventually catch fire and sparked the imaginations of gamers the world over. It had some humble beginnings, but it has certainly gone on to become one of the most illustrious game series of all time. I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for the Nintendo 64 version. Did you get a chance to play that game? Have any fond memories? Share your experience in the comments section below. Happy 22nd birthday, Super Smash Brothers. Now playing. So here in Taiwan, we have these crane machine galleries all over the place. You know those machines where you take the claw hand and you try to reach in and grab some kind of toy? It could be a stuffed animal. Actually, figures are really popular here. There's a lot of Dragon Ball, Z figures, other anime characters. They throw all kinds of crazy stuff in these machines. So on our daily haunts, my kids and I walk past these galleries all the time, and every so often they get an itch to try the claw. And I try to discourage them from doing it because, well, you guys know these things are rigged. You're not supposed to win. If you won the game all the time, it wouldn't be a profitable venture for the people who own the machines. So even if you have 
like a perfect grab, very often times, the claw just spontaneously releases. So like 99% of the time, my wife and I just say, no, remember, these are rude machines. They just try to steal your money. But every now and again, we cave, and my wife did recently this week, and all three of my kids were basically in tears about it. I honestly don't know why we do this to ourselves, but they were feeling pretty down about it, and I was trying to think if there was some way how I can recreate the experience for them in a more positive way. And then I remembered this game from Hell Laboratories, who you might remember from being the developers of Super Smash Bros. 64, and they recently created this game called Part-Time UFO, where you're basically a UFO that comes down to Earth and uses your crane to move around these objects in this physics-based, puzzle-solving missions. All of them are self-contained, and there's a pretty wide variety of them. You could collect fruits or balance circus animals, stack cheerleaders, all manner of different stuff. And I'm really happy to say that my kids love the game, Hopefully it offered some small redemption after their crane machine fails out in the real world. It does have some really cool co-op where two little space crane operators can go in at the same time and tag team some of the more difficult, time-sensitive balancing obstacles. But even after we powered down the game, I found myself going back to it on my own and playing some of these challenges myself. Each stage has three different objectives, and the game doesn't exactly spell it out for you. You have this little image that's kind of a clue that might push you subtly in the direction of what you need to accomplish, and every time you do, you get a medal. If you get enough medals, you unlock more missions. It's a pretty addictive game loop. The game oozes charm, and you see the fingerprints of some other little HAL projects in there. Quite a few QB cameos. Even Kirby pops in now and again. I gotta say, I'm really loving the game. In fact, I popped my Switch out into portable mode more than a couple times just during the creation of this episode, during the renders and uploads and such. It's available on the eShop. It's pretty cheap. I think I paid 8 or $9 for it. And it's definitely proved its value in terms of fun. <laughs> Maybe give this one a try. Welcome to Joys and Cons with me, Hero TJ, and Dark TJ. This edition features Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for Nintendo Switch. Take it away, guys. What began as a Nintendo Mascot Melee mashup has become a colossal gathering of gaming's greatest in what serves as not only a thoughtful love letter to Nintendo's fans of every franchise, but also a transcendent celebration of gaming itself. And this goes far beyond just playable representatives. Smash Ultimate showcases well in excess of 1,400 spirits and counting. From all corners of gaming to collect and assemble into teams to buff and support your favorite fighters. Show me your moves! No, like, seriously, what happened to them all? Smash 4 introduced the option to customize your character's fighting style by selecting from an array of custom moves to create exciting variations between different versions of the same character. Like the Koopalings, for example. In Smash 4, they can present with a whole host of varied techniques. But in Smash Ultimate, they're reduced to a simple skin. Not only that, just look what they did to me! Turns out, streamlining actually means removing the ability to create variations in size and shape. What if I want to create a short stack mini me or a tall towering titan? What if I want my me super trim, slim and grim? Or how about a big buff, beefy meefy? I guess by streamlining what they actually meant was one size fits all. Lame. Oh, and I'm still waiting for my me classic mode. Whether you just like smashing, mini games, challenges, classic arcade modes, tournaments, or collectibles, Smash Ultimate has something for everyone. Maybe adventure's your thing. How about a full-blown quest in the form of World of Light? A video game globe-trotting character unlocking Spirit Collectathon, weaving together the myriad and disparate worlds of the gaming universe. This iteration of Smash is supposed to be ultimate, right? A vain boast when it fails to offer a campaign mode even remotely comparable to Subspace Emissary. Oh, and I love taunting as much as the next shade, but why in the wide world of Wii Sports am I not able to utilize the D-pad to move my fighter in 2D environments that don't even utilize omnidirectional movement? Oh, and online be hot garbage. Continuing in the tradition of Super Smash Bros. Melee, and every sequel since, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate dramatically expands the roster of playable characters to unimaginable proportions. In fact, everyone is here! And with Fighters Pass 1 and 2, the hits keep on coming. <laughs> Woohoo! Not everyone is here. There's at least one noticeable missing mustachioed malcontent. As expansive as this roster may be, it's anything but complete until it includes... Waluigi. Fight me. This has been another edition of Joys and Cons with me, Hero TJ, and Dark TJ. This episode's Spirit of the Week was suggested by Mark Shadow 2 We're looking at number 933, 
Gigamac from Punch-Out for the Wii. While Little Mac has made an appearance in all three Punch-Out titles, going all the way back to the NES, Gigamac did not appear until the Wii version, in two-player mode actually, where both players will assume a version of Little Mac with the ability to transform into Gigamac after filling up the special cage. Gigamac also appears in Smash Ultimate as Little Mac's Final Smash. This is actually a returning feature from Super Smash Bros. 4, where Little Mac made his debut, and where Gigamac also had a trophy. The trophy description reads, This Final Smash turns Little Mac into a hulking monster of a man. In Punch-Out for Wii, Little Mac could take this form by building up the gauge with some well-timed blows. In this game, it's referring to Smash 4, it seriously powers up his attacks and makes him even faster. He'll completely dominate on the ground, but air battles are outside his weight class. And as anyone who plays as Little Mac and Smash Ultimate knows that remains true. If you equip the Gigamax Spirit, you're looking at a fist attack buff, which means a slight increase in punch and elbow strike power. Thanks to Mark Shadow02 for the suggestion. If there's a particular spirit you'd like to see featured as the Spirit of the Week, leave your suggestion in the comment section below, and if yours is selected, you'll be recognized in the episode with an on screen credit, just like Mark Shadow02. Alright, everybody, it's time to sound off. I decided we'll stick with the Smash Brothers theme for this episode's talking point. So my question for you is, out of all the iconic mascots featured in Super Smash Brothers 64, what character is most notably absent in your opinion? Now we obviously got all the heavy hitters, Mario's in there, Link, Donkey Kong, Samus, Pikachu, Fox, Kirby, Yoshi, even Captain Falcon came to play. But were there any obvious oversights? In my opinion, Yes, there were. There's one character who I'm really surprised didn't make it into that initial cast. And for me, that is Little Mac. Not only is Punch-Out one of the most popular and well-regarded original NES titles, but Little Mac is one of Nintendo's only characters who is actually a professional fighter. So the fact that he would be omitted from their first foray into fighting games, I always felt was a little surprising. Melee definitely filled in a lot of holes and added a lot of really cool and popular characters, but it wouldn't actually be until Super Smash Bros. 4 for Wii U and 3DS, the fourth iteration of the game where Little Mac would become a playable character. Long overdue, in my opinion, but he did eventually get there. So enough about my thoughts. What do you think? Please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. I can't wait to read them. And that wraps up this edition of Me Weekly. You know what? I really appreciate you spending the time with me. I know your time's important. I know you got stuff to do. It's truly an honor that you felt this show was worthy enough to allocate some of that time to me. Hopefully I'll see you again next time. Until then, thanks for playing.